Good evening, and welcome to the Hawaii Theater Center. Dave Moss, uh, the executive director of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, joining you here on our Tuesday night, tuning in with Iggy and Dave, and some special guests this evening, uh, leading up to our rebroadcast on Hawaii Public Radio this evening, uh, a program from last season called Two Seasons. So, Iggy, want to introduce our guests tonight? Yes, two seasons, but four fantastic. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> you and I? <laughs> and uh, uh, who should I start with? Let's start with John Magnuson, composer, and Scott Janersh, our esteemed principal oboe player, Just for speak. a very special concert. So, uh, is everyone settled in? Should we start? Or yeah, let's, let's give people a chance to settle in, take their seats, grab a glass of wine. Uh, and while we do that, maybe, maybe we can talk about you know, our wonderful sponsors that have provided a wonderful charcuterie plate. Uh, Chef Kevin Lee here from uh, Pai Honolulu here in Chinatown. So thank you, Chef Kevin Lee and your team over here in the neighborhood. Appreciate your support of the Hawaii Theater Center uh, and uh, the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra as well. So thank you so much for that. And uh, yeah, we've got a few minutes as people get settled here before we jump into the uh, the meat of the subject. The meat. You, did you, are you, do you say charcuterie or charcuterie? You know. <laughs> uh, uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> uh, and, and introducing the sponsor tonight will be Iggy. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it gets better and better. You know? It does, yeah. This is week three for us. Yes. Uh, so we really appreciate those of you who have joined uh, week after week here. Uh, we're going to continue this on with the, the rebroadcast through September 8th, and then we're working on what's next, because this has been such a success, and we want to keep bringing you music, we want to keep being engaged with you, we want to keep the music alive, and this is allowing us to do this still during these unprecedented times. So thank you for joining, and, you know, what have you been doing? Yes, yeah, so, uh, so um, of course, we know very well Scott and, and John, but uh, uh, before we get to your piece de resistance um, about this uh, concert that was broadcasted, I have to, uh, as a disclaimer, uh, unfortunately, I was out of town myself in the fall, so I couldn't be on stage performing the music with you guys, but I did hear it uh, this past weekend because I wanted to re freshen up a little bit for today, and I was quite impressed. Um, I, as I uh, like to say, sometimes we welcome new members, uh, new guest artists, sometimes we have uh, uh, family members, uh, regular guest artists. Uh, one uh, novelty was conductor Kitaro Harada, and um, as I was listening to the broadcast, I just felt um, how nimble the orchestra was performing and, and how quickly uh, things came along because, as you know, we only have uh, four rehearsals before performing mm -hmm. to concerts. So, um, Scott and John, um, before we get to talk about you and your music, uh, what was your impression to, uh, to work with a new conductor, first time in Hawaii, first time conducting the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, uh, brings his own repertoire, the, the Prokofiev, Prokofiev, Prokofiev right? yeah. number one number and one. Schubert number five. Yeah, correct. Uh, intermission. Mm -hmm but then has to discover this new uh, substantial work of yours, John. So maybe Scott first, uh, sure. your, your first uh, impressions of working with Kitaro Harada. Well, uh, Kitaro Harada came, of course, very highly recommended. We were all really looking forward to working with him. Um, and prior to his arrival in Honolulu, he wanted to really study the score because as, with all new works, that involves a lot of study and preparation. So he was furnished with a score. Uh, John had arranged the chamber version of the piece for orchestra over the summer, so that was forwarded to Keitaro. And we were also to, uh, able to gain permission for him to listen to performances of the chamber version, so at least he could get it in his head about what the concept of the piece was like. Um, so then it just became a matter of rehearsing the piece and allowing everyone to become familiar with it. Um, and I thought he did a wonderful job. He was very... Uh, succinct with using the time. Uh, I thought the orchestra did a fabulous job. The whole program was very challenging. It wasn't just <laughs> just ours. Ours would have been enough. This oboe concerto would have been enough, but there were two very difficult pieces on the first half, and Kitaro did a 
superb job, I thought. And, Go ahead. and I think, you know, Iggy, you said four rehearsals, but I seem to remember we had maybe three. I know we had only two. F oh, because it's four total for the whole repertoire. Right, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we, so we, we had actually three. only two rehearsals with the concerto. The first evening was just the other two pieces. And then... And that was a bit scary for me because, you know, this is a right, work because, that's over 40 minutes long right. and it's new. And, and it, I mean, there, it, Scott starts off stage. There is an offstage percussionist. There, there are electronics. You know, there, there are the sounds of the forest where the oboe grew up. Um, there's the sound of the ocean from the shore, shores below. I mean, there's, there's really this sort of, you know, a lot going on. There's a whole production. And well, he, choreography. And right. he was... He uh, he had the orchestra together uh, beautifully by the end of that uh, that second evening. I was mm -hmm. I, I was I was actually breathing during the <laughs> during the first sh the first showing because uh, um, as opposed to working with Kitaro, usually you have a lot more time to work with someone. Uh, well, of course, you you work with Scott for how long? Well, we we'll get into it more in detail, but yeah. just. The length of to come to fruition with Scott, the final project. How long did that take? Your piece. Well, so we talked about it, I think, and then I, then, then I didn't really get back to it until about a year later. But by the time I started composing, it was in in seriousness. It was already mid December, and I of delivered it. And I delivered it in uh, the beginning of March. Wow. So and that was the chamber version, and then once we had that done, I I uh, arranged it for orchestra over the summer. Wow, what a project! Yeah. And for a conductor, at which point you know, especially Kataro, he's he's young, he's energetic, he he brings a certain amount of excitement to the podium. Um, and what is that like, watching that for the first time, seeing your piece come alive, with a with someone like Kataro? I mean, so the thing about Kitaro is that he had done quite a bit of new music yeah. before, and I think he's very comfortable uh, in in that role of of you know mediating between the composer and and the, I mean he invited me to all the rehearsals, which I don't think all composers <laughs> get get to do that, or you know, or at least they they are invited after a certain you know work has been sure. done, yeah. uh, but. But it was really it was it was smooth and I mean our musicians are fabulous you know and they're so dedicated and and I think for a piece like this you know culturally it really strikes a tone and and I think Keitaru came in understanding that and really wanting to dig in. Absolutely. Well, he's become a good friend of the orchestra, and we are expecting to see Kay here in a few months here. I think he's scheduled to conduct uh, in October or in March, I believe, uh, coming up in a few months here with, uh, with a young violinist, I believe, uh, doing a program. Uh, so as things progress, we look forward to, to having him back here. Uh, you know, he is recently named the new music director of the Savannah Symphony in Georgia, uh, just as someone whose career is just ready to take off. And uh, he's actually been a dear friend of mine for a number of years, and uh, I expect him to be tuning in right now. So, uh, and speaking of people tuning in, uh, we'd love to interact with you tonight. And so uh, we're trying something new here. Uh, we have a number that you can text. Uh, it is 808-528-528. 0506. You can find that on the bottom of your screen as well. And we welcome you to ask questions, uh, engage with us. Uh, we're here to take those and, and to, you know, work together in this. And uh, I think we should have a quiz to get people going on this. What do you, what do you think? Are you guys yeah, we're open talking to that? A little bit. Yes. So the question for the evening is... No uh, Googling. No Googling. Yes, no Googling. <laughs> it came down to two. I almost want to give people the opportunity to answer both of them because they're, they're so, uh, so unique. Um, but I'm going to go with the question because I'm new here. And uh, Scott has been here in Honolulu and Hawaii for a number of years, a part of this community uh, who has really made the orchestra what it is. Uh, and so we would like to know how long you think Scott has been an oboist here in Honolulu. A lot of years. A lot of years. A lot of years. So ask your, answer your, we'll answer your questions, send those in, and uh, you know, we will... 
we will try to figure out uh, what that number is as we continue to talk about the program tonight. So this piece, John, it, it, it brings together so many pieces of Hawaiian culture uh, using the symphony as a, a backdrop, a centerpiece. How do you describe it? What was your idea behind that? And how does the, the oboe as a solo instrument play into that? Yeah, so, so I think part of the challenge that I had was, was this, you know, honoring this oboe, this fabulous oboe. Scott, do you, do you, you no, don't have the oboe, I do you? I, I get nervous traveling with it. Okay. But I did bring some of the kawila wood, so okay. I have a sample. So this is not the normal oboe you play on at Sunday Masterworks? No, oboes are typically made out of an African blackwood called grenadilla, also another dense, almost as dense as this, but not quite. So this is a very dense wood that uh, in the Hawaiian culture was very useful. They made all manner of digging tools and all other instruments. It was a, a very important part of the culture. And uh, so they held this wood in very high esteem. And so when a friend of John's, um, I learned, had a stash of, of all kinds of Hawaiian woods, he's the one I sought out to say, this is my project. I want to make a wood that is of this place. What wood would you partner with this project in donating? And out of all the fabulous collections of Milo and Koa and all these other wonderful woods, uh, this Kawila wood was what he decided would be most suited for a project like this. So that was sort of the genesis of figuring out what the material would be. And of course then after that it was a question of finding a maker that would work with an unknown wood. And so I, I approached the Howards of London folks here and um, ha dragged some samples over to them and said, can I contract you to build an instrument for my project? And they said, no, absolutely not. Forget about it. We don't know anything about this wood. But they made a gentleman's agreement with me that they would try to experiment with the wood over time and see if it would be suitable. So they partnered with the project in a big way in bringing this oboe to life, and they did a spectacular job. But my understanding is you didn't cut a tree to make an no. oboe, right? No. So, so. Um, the story actually goes a little bit further back. S Scott's uh, wind quintet, the string wind quintet, mm -hmm. uh, was touring a, a piece of mine that I had written for them called Paka'alana Kila. And we were on Kauai, uh, and that's where he met Mickey. Uh, we had just finished performing, and we, we, I think we were having margaritas, you know, yeah. after, after the performance, we wearing, wearing funny, funny hats. Mexican hats and talking. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> Uh, that's where he met Mickey, and um, Mickey's friend, Ed Kaivi, had actually, so this is a, 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 a by now a kupuna in Anahola, where Mickey also lives, and, and uh, back in the, I think it was Hurricane Eva, uh, this tree went down up in Koke'e, and there was a call out you know, to all, all of the native artisans and, and uh, you know, people who would, who would find the, the wood valuable to go harvest the broken pieces. And so this was one of those. Mm -hmm. So, um, Scott, did you approach John and, and asked for John to, to write a piece that had a significant Hawaiian nine in it? Well, I approached John for many reasons. Um, for one thing, I knew he knew how to honor the culture by writing something significant because we had, I had the experience with him with the Paka'a and the whole genesis of that. And also through his many connections with, um, with cultural practitioners here and people who are practicing uh, keeping the Hawaiian culture alive, I knew that they would serve as resources through his connection. So in so many ways, John was really integral to growing the project. Um, and so that was really um, part of the journey that was really critical. And, and that's why I was delighted that he agreed to do the project. Um, so yeah. so we're, getting, we're getting some questions, ah, actually. So, oh. uh, and, and some friends of yours are, are watching from uh, Molokai who remember when this project was first uh, put together. So uh, some friends going back a number of years and uh, great that they're joining us. And the, uh, we have another question. Um, apparently, Scott, you're a pianist as well. 
Very good pianist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I get well, it. well, the question is, would you have a piano made of Hawaiian wood, and would John write a piece for that? That's an excellent question. Uh, I don't know, a piano made out of Kawila wood, for one thing, it'd be so heavy, you probably couldn't move it anywhere. <laughs> but it would be, it would be tough. It, it would, would be, be tough. tough. <laughs> it would be it's very, very strong, very strong. Uh, I think that's a fabulous idea. Yeah. 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 I'll write it. All right. Yeah. All right. If anyone would like to, to help get that started, that'd be awesome. I, I should say, though, uh, before we go on, another thing that was critical to allowing this project to go forward was my finding a fiscal sponsor to work with to, um, you know, collect funds that would allow the oboe to be built, that would allow John to get paid, that would allow all of the... Yeah. So I partnered with Live Music Awareness, and they were a critical partner to me. They actually have a website where there's more information about the oboe and the project. There's a video of my trying the oboe at Howard's for the very first time three years ago, which is a goosebumps moment in the life of this project. So I'd encourage everyone to visit that website. Yeah, we'd be happy to throw that in a, a follow-up email to our guests here. It's such a great story to tell and so important to, as you said, the sponsorship, the, the fiscal means to make these projects happen. Yeah. Uh, it, it's so crucial to the work we do. So thank you. Well, the community, since it was a gift to the community, the community really stepped forward to make it happen. We got several major gifts by some people we're all very familiar with, and it wouldn't have happened otherwise. Can I just say yes, something about do. donations? Because I think this is a really important time for our cultural organizations. And I, and I really appreciated the opportunity to donate when I bought a ticket to come here tonight. Uh, that was genius. So well, thank, thank you, you for, for that. Your donation. Uh, if, you, if you've watched the earlier shows, uh, Iggy knows that my, my favorite thing to do on Fridays is to call our donors. Uh, and, mm. and it's really just the opportunity to say thank you, especially in these uh, unprecedented times. We do rely on your support to, to make sure that the symphony can go forward and be able to program creative things that connect to this community, connect to this culture, uh, that we can be this melting pot and bridge uh, in this community with, with our music. So thank you for all those who continue supporting us, and, and thank you for, for bringing that up, John. Oh, thank yeah. you so much, John. Yeah. John, a um, couple weeks ago, we broadcasted Berlioz Symphony Fantastique, yeah. which is program music. And mm -hmm. even last week when we had uh, Sibelius Symphony No. 2, which is not, there's not too much of a narrative, but you can still feel the wide expanse of, of uh, um, Finland. Uh, tell us about your piece, because it has a great story. It has many stories, in fact. Yeah, in fact, 12. <laughs> 12. So I, I had to find a way to structure this. Um, you know, the, I mentioned the, the first important thing was about honoring the wood and its, its connection to the culture. And so, but, but there was also the age of the wood, which, which we found um, that uh, uh, it, it's around 300 years old which puts it in the same time period as Vivaldi's uh, Four Seasons. Four seasons. And uh, I, I feel close to Vivaldi because this is where my grandfather was born and raised, uh, my mother's father. And, and so I, and I visited you know, in Venezia, just north of Venezia. And I feel, so I thought, I thought I have to find a way to, to make this musical connection to the Four Seasons, uh, but, but reducing it down to two, because here in Hawaii we only have two seasons, and also creating this um, multiple touch point to each of the sort of Kawila connections. And, and there are so many more. I did, I did a whole bunch of research. I had a whole spreadsheet that was color-coded and, and trying to you know, find stories about Kawila wood from each of the islands so that nobody would feel left out. And, and it, um, you know, it was kind of crazy um, in, in terms of the, the, the organizing of that. And it's easy to sort of get caught up in the story. Uh, but when it comes right down to it, this is music that you're listening to. And so I think that's where you, you might hear quite a bit of even though you're hearing some, you know, especially some uh, Hawaiian percussion, 
Uh, we have kalao, uh, which are uh, used in as hula implements to dance to. Uh, there is kapa um, a kapa beater. Yeah. So we have at a, at a moment um, uh, Rini Aia Ibello, who is 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 an amazing kapa maker. Delani Tanahi, um, Maile Andrade, and and a few more of their cohorts joined the symphony orchestra with their kappa beaters and they start a movement beating on their kappa, um, the, the kua, these are anvils. And you hear this sound of wood on wood with the you know, mediation of the kappa. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that was sort of like a, a all, you know, in, incorporating all of this into the symphonic world was a real stretch. I thought, boy, you are crazy. <laughs> it was very complex, but, but very, as, as you said, very approachable. Um, I was listening uh, this weekend, and I actually had the, the program notes that uh, you sent, and I think some of them are, are uh, available online. But just to summarize, it's uh, 12 vignettes, and each has a relationship to the, to the wood. Um, why 12? 12 moons. 12 moons according to? The season. Yeah. And the, uh, the particular movement would have something related to Kawila wood in that specific time of year, you know, wow. so. So it was a very, I mean, you know, we can learn so much from uh, Hawaiians and there, there are some, you know, increasingly wonderful, uh, wonderful resources in the Hawaiian language. And I, you know, I encourage everybody to go out and learn Hawaiian language because with that language, you really learn about the culture and, and you know, people might, you know, I, I heard you say, Scott, that, you know, to, to save the Hawaiian culture, it'll always be around. I don't, you know, it's never been gone, I feel like, um, but it's because of the language that people really have, have uh, an understanding of, of um, so there's ulukau.org. If if you, <laughs> yeah. I I uh, I I spent a lot of time, you know, doing that kind of research to uh, to to find find which sort of connections uh, would would be appropriate for for which movement. And it, it was very colorful because you would you would hear a nice uh, sustain. Oh boy, I don't know how you did that, but like it seemed like there's some notes you were just held for five minutes while oh, you hear some percussion. The bird catcher. The bird catcher. Yeah, yeah that was uh, movement six. That was that was supposed to emulate the patience that was needed by the bird catcher, who would sit very still with his kawila pole and his bait and wait for the birds to come. So that long note was supposed to, you know, emulate you know the length of time that it takes and. Both of the notes, I think, were over a minute. I had to do some circular breathing there. Um, that's another chance. You know, when he was writing this piece, let me tell you, when we first started, he jotted down some ideas, came over, he played them on the piano. I said, John, I can't do that. You know, <laughs> but so he we, did them. No, he did well, them. Some of them he I could them. do. Some of them I could do. Others, you know, it's like, well, let me work on it and think about it. But there's all sorts of multiphonics, double tonguing, all sorts of technical things. Um, but, you know, it's very exciting. When you add all of those components in, it just made it more interesting. Was it, how different was it to uh, learn to play this particular oboe as opposed to uh, a, a, a regular oboe? Well, the interesting thing was this oboe is so wonderful. It was very easy. It was a very easy transition. I mean, it, it just, and as I played more with it, the instrument and I found, found our voice. I mean, we're still finding our voice. I mean, hopefully this instrument will last another 300 years. Yeah. That's what I'm hoping. That's why I had, I wanted it made and, and used and honored. And the noble so. thing is that it's actually not yours. You're, you're making this oboe accessible? I am, and that actually leads us to the ongoing nature of the project, which the two prongs that are left in our four-legged stool, not three-legged stool, are... Um, John and I have lots of archive material, and we want to, to make a documentary sort of showcasing this. The other thing is to find a home for the instrument. I'm, it's currently at my house, although the owner is technically my fiscal sponsor because they handle all the income and expense. So 
finding a home, I've already made overtures to the local museums, um, and those conversations are ongoing, but if there's an individual or an institution out there that can curate the instrument in a safe environment, make it available to use, that would be ideal. So we're still looking for that. Well, we're getting a few more questions, and okay. uh, one of them I'm going to answer by picking up on something that you just talked about, which was patience. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting a lot of questions about what the next season is going to look like. And uh, as, as we all know, uh, every day there seems to be a, a new set of announcements, a new set of guidelines, a new set of challenges for us. And uh, what, what we're working on right now is more of this. We're working for a safe return for our musicians back to the stage. Uh, and it takes a little bit of time to figure out all those pieces. But we're going to stay true to our mission to bring this community music uh, throughout the year. Uh, some of it will look like this, uh, and some of it will be in person with small groups, and uh, we look forward to announcing those plans in the coming weeks. Here. I know the musicians are eager uh, as well. We've been working very closely to figure out all these details, and I'm grateful for their continued support in this. And just in, in 30 seconds, because I'm going to give you, John, the hardest question, uh, I think, at the moment, and give, just give you 30 seconds, because we want to all turn into uh, HPR2 to listen to the broadcast. What does the future look like for composers with Hawaiian culture? How, how do we go forward with, with what the project that you've set up? How do we continue that, that collaboration, that, that important piece that brings us all together, especially here in Hawaii? So I think, I think it's just continuing to collaborate. I think that's the important thing and, and, and all of us collaborating together, you know, mixing it up. Yeah. Making, making um, you know, those parts of the community that never see each other, bringing them together. I think that's what we need. We had, you know, Michael Pili Pang's halau there at the concert. Uh, we had the, the um, you know, the, the kappa makers with their, you know, these, these are people who are out in the, you know, in, in the cultural realm. Uh, they're not coming to concerts, but they were there for that. Uh, I, think, I think the future is bright. Yeah, bigger seat at the table. Yeah, yeah for all of us to, to really have a bigger table. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, and we can all learn. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. That's, it, there's so much story to be told around the, the, the work that you and Scott did on this project. And uh, I'm excited to tune in and, and listen to the broadcast here in a few minutes. And uh, we had another quick question, Scott. As, uh, what was the difference between the chamber version that you first performed and, and the orchestral version, the full orchestral version, for you as a soloist? Were there many changes? Well, you know, there were, it's a different economy of scale when you're dealing with the full, the full forces of a symphony orchestra. Um, and so the chamber version was a little more intimate, uh, a little more controllable balance-wise, but the full symphonic version you have the ability to utilize that many more colors, you know, to emphasize different effects and colors within the orchestra. They were equally satisfying to me. They were both really, really wonderful, great to play. Good versatility for the piece. Well, and yeah, and I, I certainly, and I know John does too, hope that it is played again by others, you know, Absolutely. won't just be my thing. Great. Well, I really appreciate you joining uh, Iggy and I uh, for our talk here, we could spend hours talking we about could, this piece, and uh, unfortunately, we have a broadcast starting here. But before we go, uh, I want to be sure that we thank our sponsors uh, for our masterwork series, the Halakulani. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Greg Dunn here at the Hawaii Theater Center for all his support in making these possible. Uh, of course, Donard on our uh, 808 video productions behind the lens there. Uh, Hound and Quail for our radio uh, to remind ourselves to tune in to HPR2. Uh, of course, Kevin, uh, Kevin Lee at Pi Honolulu for the wonderful charcuterie plates. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for continuing to support this. Uh, Iggy and I will be back here next Tuesday for Ode to Joy, uh, our broadcast. Uh, and I think we all need a little joy in our life. We do. Uh, so please join us again next Tuesday. Uh, as we approach 8 o'clock here, we invite you to join us on HPR2 over the air throughout Hawaii or stream the performance via the HPR app at hawaiipublicradio.org. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Mahalo for your support, and we look forward to seeing you very soon.